All right. Howdy, folks. Welcome back to this week's Q&A for the JPS Education Portal. And you're with myself, Jacob Skeppis, and Jackson Pios, the people for Punching Peacock, all the way in Perth, Australia. Not in lockdown. Clearly a lot more sun uh, over there. He's got a nice tan. And what happened to your eyebrow, Jackson? I got in this really tough fight with a wombat. Wombat. Nasty yeah. Those of you who are, who don't live in Australia, you wouldn't understand. Uh, the wombats down here, they're, they're very dangerous. Very dangerous. Jackson has a pet wombat, actually. Tough little um, suckers they are. <laughs> Jokes aside, we are here to answer your questions. And this edition of the Q&A is going to be uh, released, uh, not just in the education portal, which is our one-stop shop uh, education content hub, uh, where we release uh, educational videos and lectures each week from uh, our portal uh, content creators. We also have articles, exercise demonstration videos, as well as a fitness knowledge bombs, which is basically a rundown of all the best content uh, around the globe uh, that we get our hands on and we break it down in very simple terms for you. So all of that for the price of a couple of cups of coffee each week. Uh, for those of you who aren't subscribers, if you want to check it out, the link will be in the description box below and we'd love to have you join us. We're nearly at 100 subscribers and Jackson has said uh, verbatim that when we do get to 100 subscribers, he's going to do a lecture, one of his weekly lectures, uh, Naked. So guys, we want your help to make that happen. Uh, I said that I'd join in and do one naked as well. I'm not sure if people want to see that. My rig's clearly <laughs> not as well-defined uh, and chiseled as Jackson's, but it uh, should be fun. So help us uh, make that happen, guys. Uh, and to our portal subscribers, thank you very much for submitting your questions. Some great questions coming through this week. And we're going to get into those first and then open it up for our wider community who have submitted questions to Jackson and my uh, Instagram accounts uh, for this uh, specific episode of uh, our weekly Q and A's. So first question is from Damien Jackson. This one's in your wheelhouse. If a person is hitting 2.2 to 2.2 grams of protein per kg across four to five meals, is there a benefit of an additional bolus of casein at bedtime? And if so, are there any studies on this? And that was from uh, Damien. So thank you, Damien, for submitting that question. I'll let this one uh, be tackled by Jackson. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, a study that springs to my mind, uh, which was published around six years ago, um, they basically set out to, to investigate this exact question. Um, and they basically um, split the participant cohort into two groups, both receiving a casein supplement, uh, but one of the groups received the casein supplement just pre-bed and the other received the same casein supplement, uh, but earlier on in the day with a matched protein intake between the two groups to see if there was any sort of, if they could isolate any sort of particular pre-bed um, slow release effect action of the protein um, in the casein if it's consumed at that point in time. Now, what they saw was uh, when protein intake was matched across the day, there was no difference in muscle growth or, or muscle strength um, irrelevant of when the, the casein supplement was consumed. Um, but that, so that would give you the impression that, that perhaps it doesn't matter and, and perhaps it, it doesn't matter when specifically you're already at that two to two and a half grams of protein um, per day per kilo of body weight per day spread relatively evenly throughout the day. Uh, but I, I just think it's, there's something to consider is that um, there's certainly not going to be any downsides to, to at least distributing a, a reasonable chunk of your protein um, at, to, towards a pre-bed meal um, and, and even more so a, a perhaps a slow digesting protein. Um, if we want to just speak from a theoretical basis, we know that to basically maintain positive muscle protein balance state, we need something called hyperaminoacidemia, which is basically just a, a reasonable concentration of, of amino acids in the blood. Now, if you are consuming, let's say, your last protein feeding at perhaps 7 p.m., and your next protein feeding might be at 8 a.m. Uh, the following day, I just think that there's significant potential for you to not be in a sustained state 
of hyperaminoacidemia. Um, and therefore, there is potential for you to fall out of, of positive protein balance and perhaps um, into what we consider colloquially a catabolic state or, or negative protein balance. Um, so the good thing about casein is that it's, it's released into a bloodstream over many, many hours, which basically means that the release of amino acids happens very gradually and slowly. Um, and, you're all, and you're able to sustain basically a level of amino acids in the blood for much longer than you would otherwise if you consumed either not a pre-bed protein feeding or perhaps a very quick fast digesting um, pre-bed protein. So it's probably not the, it's, I, I wouldn't say that it's, that it's the key to gains or, or that it's essential. And, and for the large majority of the population, just trying to lift weights and eat protein and look a little bit better, it's probably not gonna to matter too much. Um, but for the guys that, that are really trying to maximize uh, their physique enhancement. Um, I think it, it's just worth remembering that it's certainly not going to have any downside. And if it's going to have any effect at all, based on, on a theoretical rationale, the, the effects are only going to be positive. Yeah, awesome. I think that's a very comprehensive answer. I'm not going to even uh, attempt to add anything to that. Uh, great question, Damien, and very impressive answer as always, Jackson. Uh, next much. question is from Moe. Big Moe, how are you, brother? Uh, he asks, once you're approaching your threshold and capacity with quality sessions, how do you further your ability to help more people without dropping the quality of your service? So he's speaking in terms of coaching here. Do I simply, yeah, personal training, yep. Okay. So do I simply begin thinking of a way to hire someone uh, to work on board with me? Do I reduce sessions down to 30, 45 minutes from 45, 60 minutes? Would love to learn how I could go about hiring someone as it has been crossing my mind. Okay, this is a very, very uh, different type of question. Yeah, and very, uh, very hard to answer without a lot more detail about your business and uh, specific context that you're working in. But what I would say as a general rule of thumb, as a coach, when you start building up your client base is to start to focus on developing your systems uh, to the point that you're able to streamline more of your coaching services and that you're not uh, spending uh, superfluous amounts of time are uh, doing administrative uh, type tasks. If that is what's preventing you from taking on more people, obviously uh, your coaching is going to be limited to the time frames that you have available to coach, which are generally going to be uh, in the mornings and in the evenings, split shifts for most personal trainers and then weekends. Um, but once you fill that up, I think the best thing that you can start to do is look to transition clients uh, online, uh, especially once they're confident with you. Uh, or start to uh, filter your clients into semi-privates where you have some of your more experienced, uh, well-developed uh, uh, clients who are competent in the gym. You can get them to uh, all train together in a semi-private and that way that will free up a number of other time slots for you to take on other one-on-one -on -one clients. And the same goes for the clients who might not need as much hands-on uh, time and attention anymore. You could push them into online coaching and again, you're still offering them a service. It's going to be at a cheaper rate for them, which is great. Uh, it frees you up. You can take on another client, help them. Uh, and that's what we do here at JPS. So basically we have a bit of a, a pyramid structure where we have our PT at the base uh, and our one-on-one -on -one stuff. And we try to progress people through uh, the pyramid from PT to a membership or online coaching or semi-private uh, and then to uh, becoming an athlete where they compete in physique all uh, powerlifting competitions and that is where we then use uh, those athletes to help us market and uh, generate interest in our services to show that we're experts in what we do and we can do a good job and then that brings people in for pt and it filters through nicely uh, so i think that's uh, a pretty viable way to approach uh structuring your business uh, and having a model that allows you to uh progress your clients uh, through not just your training uh, systems, but different services that will allow you to continually uh, you know, keep old clients and bring in new clients. Now to speak to the point of when you should get somebody else on board, uh, that's a really hard one to answer. And that depends a lot on where you want to take your coaching business uh, with more staff uh, becomes a lot more work. Uh, you have to start thinking about uh, changing your business model entirely because you will have a potentially a subcontractor. Uh, if you contract them to do work for you, you might have them as an employee, in which case you have to pay uh, super, withhold tax, and obviously give them uh, leave, all those kind of things. And it becomes a lot more complicated. So 
I would advise you to speak to a, a consultant, uh, an accountant, or somebody who's uh, an expert in those areas. I'm not an expert by any means in this stuff, but I have been through the process myself. Uh, but I was very fortunate to have my first few, uh, well, they weren't employees at the time. They were subcontractors, uh, be one of my best friends and uh, my brother. So it was a lot easier going through that process because I had people who I knew, who I trusted, uh, and we were very much just figuring it out as we went. We were young, dumb and reckless, and we just sort of I went hell for leather with things and slowly over time started to get a better handle on how to uh, run a business and we're still learning uh, to this day. But I would dare say the best way to start is really think about what your end game is, what your dream job in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, what that looks like, write it down, what a day in your life would look like. It's like a future authoring. Uh, Jordan Peterson's pretty uh, well known for doing this, where you write down what your future self uh, you know, looks like and who you want to be. Uh, and you can do that for your business. And then that should help you reverse engineer to be able to identify where you are now uh, and bridge those gaps accordingly. And if having more staff, somebody working for you, working less hours is uh, where you want to be, uh, then you'll uh, figure that out by uh, pursuing that little activity. And I'll just say one other thing. If you're doing the whole coaching thing for the love of it, uh, then it shouldn't matter whether or not you get on another person. Uh, it depends if you're ambitious or you have goals that are business related uh, and or whether you are financially driven. And if you're financially driven, uh, I would dare say scaling your business to offer products and services that allow you to make passive income is where uh, you want to be taking things. Uh, so, you know, coaching is obviously going to be very much uh, limited to the manpower you have behind you. Uh, but if you're looking to develop a business that runs itself, uh, that makes money while you sleep, uh, thinking about uh, creating revenue streams that uh, make you money uh, without doing a lot of uh, ongoing work and providing ongoing services is uh, something to think about and consider anyway. And I, I just would add, don't change your session times. If you've been providing a session time that's working, you're building clients and they enjoy that, don't change your session times to allow for more clients unless people request it, obviously, because that's just, again, changing your business model. And I guess uh, that kind of uh, <clears throat> adjustment to your services, some people might get pissed off about that and you might have further problems that, uh, yeah, you didn't expect. But that's all I've got to say on that. Hopefully I answered that for you, Moe. Uh, next question here is from Shakib. Uh, thank you for submitting this one, brother. And he asks, I'm a personal trainer and I've never competed before and I don't have the intention to do so. Can I still coach physique athletes if I've never wanted to go through the process of a contest prep? Thank you. Jackson, what are your thoughts on this one? This is an interesting question. A really good question. I'm just gathering my thoughts for a second. Jackson's dieting guys. He's, uh, in the uh, nitty gritty of a fat loss phase. So he's uh, taking a little bit longer than usual when he's had a good 700 grams of carbs in him before midday. <laughs> uh, my, my thoughts are that, that yes, you can, but you're probably not going to be as effective as a coach who has experienced it. Uh, bodybuilding is this very unique thing uh, and I, 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 when I say bodybuilding, I say physique competitions in that no one can really understand it until they've done it themselves. Um, and, and someone coming sort of looking from the outset inwards, they might think that it's as simple as sort of having some, some chicken and salad um, and going to the gym quite regularly. Um, but for anyone who's actually experienced a, a really tough contest prep they'll understand that that the psychological disruption and the mood disruption and um, the food focus and things like that 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 really sort of take hold of you and basically can can it's in some stages at the latter end of the contest prep flip your your world upside down in a sense um, that they will just understand that the the, the the physique athletes who have actually walked in those shoes, I'll understand just um, how much how much deeper contest prep goes than just sort of eating regular protein and, and getting to the gym quite regularly. And my fear is that as a coach who hasn't experienced the negatives 
of, of contest prep, you'll just find it very difficult to empathize with your athlete when they're going through those struggles. Now, if they are going to get in, in contest shape and, and competitive contest shape, they absolutely are going to have to go through those struggles. And if you, as the coach, um, can't associate with those struggles or, or perhaps um, can't understand them because you haven't experienced them yourself, um, it's just going to make your um, problem solving capacity, I guess, uh, quite hampered. Um, and, and, and I find one of, the, one of the best things that allows me to work effectively as a coach, um, specifically with, with um, competition athletes, is that I fully understand how much of a toll, both physically and psychologically, contest prep takes on a person and so when it gets to those really dark stages um, I can basically rely on my own personal experiences and the things that things that allowed me to sort of navigate through those really dark dark weeks and some of the strategies that I used to basically keep moving forward without sort of breaking and cracking um, and if you're a coach who just hasn't gone through those things and hasn't had to uh basically come up with those solutions and strategies and, and navigational techniques, it's just going to be very difficult for you to therefore tell a client, okay, this is what you should do because it's getting really hard. Or how about we try this? You, you, you're always going to default to either it, it, once things get really hard um, for, for the athlete you, and, and you haven't experienced it yourself, you're probably just going to default to, saying, okay, well, just keep going or something like that. You, 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 cause that that's, that's about as deep as your toolbox goes um, because you, you just haven't had to um, ex experience those hardships yourself. And I just think that the best contest prep coaches, uh, they, they, they are the best because, number one, they, they have the, the foundational principles and the understanding of the principles to get in shape, but they also understand psychologically um, the demands of contest prep and how you can navigate them. Yeah, I thoughts, think you hit the nail on the head, man. I <clears throat> will add two things. I think, as Jackson was explaining, your ability to coach somebody is not just dependent on your declarative knowledge which is your your knowing knowledge uh you know understanding the theory of, and the physiology of fat loss and muscle retention uh energy expenditure and energy intake energy balance all those kind of things uh it's also dependent on your procedural knowledge which is the doing knowledge and you can do it yourself uh you know in your head or to a small degree in training and with your own diet, like you do a fat loss phase and say that, well, I know what it feels like, but there's part of that procedural knowledge that you, you only really get by going through the, an entire contest prep, like Jackson said, because there are some things that you experience there uh, when you push your physiology to its limits that you just can't understand by reading a textbook. It is like trying to teach someone how to drive a car, but all you know how to do is put in the coordinates in a GPS. You've never driven a car before, right? You can, yeah. you can know just, how to just as a, Just before I forget, I just, sorry to interrupt. I just want to tack on that for a second. Um, so like I'm, I'm deep into a fat loss phase at the moment and, and someone might say, okay, well I've done fat loss phases before. I therefore understand the contest prep, but I'm not in contest shape and I've lost, uh, touch on 11 kilos um, during this cut. Now, I dare say the first nine kilos were a walk in the park. And, and for someone who's done that, that might that's say, whoa, you lost so much fat and, and, and the nine kilos came off um, with a reasonable amount of dietary restraint and, and things like that. But contest prep is totally different. And, and, and now I've hit that stage where I am at quite a, a reasonable leanness, still not in contest shape and probably probably another five kilos away from contest shape shape but this final stretch which which is really what i'm talking like the dark stages like getting that five off after you've already lost 10 fuck that's a way different game to getting that first 10 off um and every hundred grams that you're trying to pull back is x x 
exponentially harder than the kilos you, that you were taking off beforehand. So I just wanted to make that, bring that little anecdote in as well. Um, it, it basically, it, it doesn't get harder in a linear fashion across the contest prep. It, it gets harder in an exponential fashion. Yes, totally, totally. And that's where, yeah, I think it's good to think about other life events and experiences in this manner so to help you understand why going through the actual process is important if you want to coach physique athletes. Um, you know, I remember vividly when, when Kobe Bryant passed away, you know, rest in peace, uh, you know, how tragic that would have been as a father being in a helicopter with your daughter, knowing that that was it, you know, that, that really made me sad. And I really like felt sympathy for him, but I couldn't empathize. I could only empathize to the point that I'm a father and that he's a father, but I've never been in that exact situation to be able to empathize because that is understanding that is putting myself in his body and in his situation and, and experiencing that firsthand. I've never experienced that firsthand. So that was outside the bandwidth of my empathy. Um, and that's where you can only start to sympathize at that point um, because you, you're operating in a very different uh, like cognitive, like an emotional space uh, at that point. So I think with the contest prep, it's like, yes, you can, uh, you know, have all the declarative knowledge and go through fat loss phases. But there's a point where your empathy, which as we know is very important to the coaching process where that ends and you're outside the boundaries of your empathy. And that makes coaching during that next phase. Like Jackson said, that last five kilos for him to get stage ready are uh, even more or difficult because there's problems and challenges that will arise that you haven't experienced and you won't know what it feels like and you won't have the tools uh, and, and techniques and strategies to be able to advise the client uh, in the best way possible, like a coach who has experienced those things would be able to. And that's what, what would separate uh, an excellent and a great coach for a contest prep versus a good coach who knows everything, how it works uh, in, in those really challenging times. Both could get the job done. Both could get a really great outcome, but it's like how well they could get the job done, how quickly and efficiently and how much emotional and empath empathy they can provide for the client during those really tough times. That's where they're different. I think that's uh, what will separate them in, in many ways. So I think to summarize uh, both Ron Jackson's points here, yes, you can coach a contest prep athlete without ever competing, but uh, your empathy and your ability to troubleshoot and navigate uh, through those tricky phases uh, will be quite limited if you haven't gone through it. Cool. Uh, next question was from Dale. Uh, we call Dale, Daisy, Daryl, Derek, whatever we want to call him, really. He's just nameless. Nomad. So, so yeah. <laughs> so we give Dale whatever name we want. Uh, Dale asks, in regards to scar tissue and case-by-case -case dependent with severity and location being obvious considerations, can we discuss how much of an effect scar tissue has in muscle contractibility, hypertrophy and strength adaptations, and anything else you may deem appropriate to the conversation. Is this something that we need to be aware of in training and program, or is it a case the body will adapt around the issue? I'm not sure how much you know about this, Jackson. It's not really. That's a, that's a tough question. Um, okay, bloody, bloody I'll, Daisy. I'll just, I'll just say from what I know, and, and that ain't much, uh, but um, from what I do know, uh, scar tissue results in less elasticity and flexibility in the muscle. Um, and scar tissue with, with significant accumulation of it is known to um, decrease basically the um, contractile, the length of the contractile capacity of, of your muscles. So in, in very simple terms, limiting your, range of motion in the muscle so from that perspective i'm thinking okay well yes scar tissue may compromise um hypertrophy just because you're now limited from taking a muscle for through a full range of motion um it's also um I, i'm i'm just sort of thinking rationally here i don't i don't um yeah i don't know don't know anything, any hard data. Um, but I also know that um, scar tissue, basically it, what, what's happening is it's like a connective tissue and it's mostly collagen. Um, and, it's, and what it does is it binds injured tissues together. Um, and when that happens, the end result is you have basically less functional 
working muscle fibers. So from that perspective, uh, I'm thinking um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to impair your muscle contraction capacity or, or your muscle strength. Um, and then when you couple that with the reduced muscle length um, and, and reduced capacity to take a muscle through its full range of motion, um, I do think that uh, muscle progression will be hampered somewhat. But what sort of scar tissue are we talking about? Like, are we talking about a single acute injury or I don't, I, I, where's the scar tissue coming from? Yeah, I, I presume that it's like post-injury uh, regeneration, at the, you know, part of the healing process. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, scar tissue is everything that you were talking about there, Jackson. I'm aware of this, the, uh, yeah, formation of scar yeah. tissue, how that uh, limits flexibility through by the, you know, decreasing the length of the, the tissue itself and therefore mm. it's contractile uh, range that it can work through and all those sorts of things. And I guess... Is probably one of those cases where being aware of those things is important for how you would then uh, just prescribe exercises and monitoring, uh, I guess, any pain or discomfort the individual has uh, when they train. Uh, but from a pragmatic level, uh, it's not really something that you will be able to change uh, as a personal trainer. So uh, you're best off referring out, uh, you know, working mm -hmm. in conjunction with a uh, physiotherapist or registered healthcare practitioner if it is problematic. Uh, but if it's not problematic, because I'm pretty sure a scar tissue doesn't have any ongoing kind of uh, pain uh, that people... It shouldn't have pain. No. Like what, we, what, what we do at the university, like when, when some of the West Coast Eagles players do like a hamstring tear or something, um, they, can, they can sort of have eight weeks where they start feeling sort of relatively recovered and pain-free and, and feel like they're ready to go out on the track. But before we put them back out on track, we, we get them to do what's called isokinetic dynamometry, which is basically like a, a very fancy uh, uh, leg curl, in a sense, where we can measure um, bilaterally the torque output of the two hamstrings. And because we have the uninjured hamstring as basically a baseline, um, even if even if the hamstring's injured, base and they and they and well, sorry, I should say, even if they feel like they're ready to roll, um, often there's a deficit between the two hamstrings when you look at the torque output, and that's when sort of the the high performance coordinators they say, okay, we well, need you need another couple of weeks um, because you're pain free, but your hamstring isn't able to produce as much force as it normally would otherwise. So. Um, I wonder if that's um, just as a result of some of that scar tissue affecting some of the the range of motion and, and the the functional capacities like we just talked about potentially. Um, but yeah, from a practical standpoint, very difficult to uh, know how to manage that. Um, and if you if you are injured, um, it's it's probably better to yeah make make sure you refer out and and have someone that can basically check that those asymmetrical de deficits um, yeah. between strength output before you start trying to um, focus on progression again. Yeah. To be honest, I, I don't have a lot of experience with it. I've had some clients who have had scar tissue and we just keep training as per normal, mm. work around it where we need to uh, make sure that we do a little bit more unilateral stuff. If the, there is a deficit and the range of motion is affecting uh, their performance or there's any kind of issues, uh, you know, between one limb and the other um, and yeah just do your best to continue to progress and program as you would otherwise do with someone who is you know training without any uh, scar tissue uh, mm -hmm. but sorry we couldn't be of more help daisy not really our wheelhouse but uh i will do some further investigation and hopefully learn a little bit more about that uh so thank you all right, some questions from Jackson's followers. Uh, the first one is, what are some strategies to use when hunger becomes difficult during fat loss? Um, <clears throat> remove liquid calories, stick to, stick to whole foods. Uh, chew your foods more frequently and slower per mouthful. Um, and th this is backed by data, which shows um, ad libitum food in intake decreases the more times you chew a mouthful um, before slowing and, and how slowly um, you chew them. Basically, the, there seems to be this, um, there is a, 
mechanism that's involved with the mastication of, of the food that seems to have a flow on effect um, onto satiety. And basically, if you're just gorging massive um, amounts of food every gulp, um, you seem to be bypassing uh, that mechanism uh, to some degree. Uh, another good one is to pay attention while you eat. So don't do TV dinners. Don't um, watch shows when you're eating, assuming hunger is getting uh, quite challenging. Uh, this is based on other research which showed when participants ate in the dark, they <clears throat> tended to underestimate substantially the quantity of food that they ate. Um, they're actually, they actually given like a supersized takeaway meal um, and they, they t when, when the researchers asked them how much they felt they ate, um, they, they, I think they undershot the, the calorie consumption by 40% or, or something in that range. So um, there's definitely something to be said for visual perception of the food you're eating, um, and that can have a flow on effect on the satiety response. Um, perception of meals is, is, is really, really fascinating to me and the, the effect that it has on satiety. Like I've, I've seen studies which showed um, just taking the same meal and distributing the volume over a smaller plate so it looks like the plate's yeah. fuller compared to having the meal packed really small on a large plate with lots of weight. Even You're that Using smaller cutlery? Yeah, yeah, the smaller yeah. cutlery is a good one. Um, is it, they seem sort of hoodoo and, and, and fake, but the the results in research are, are quite comprehensive and quite consistent when when using those strategies. So you even look at contest prep um, athletes; they start to do that without sort of any evidence that's told them to do that. As they go through a prep, they start you know opting for smaller plates with bigger you know portions on it, high volume foods. They start mm -hmm. using teaspoons to eat their cereal as opposed to mm -hmm. bigger spoons because, like intuitively, they know that well they're taking more mouthfuls. It feels like they're eating more food than they actually are. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen that with a lot of my athletes who have done that on their own accord without any scientific research you know, or knowledge of what the research has said. Mm -hmm. um, you, you touched on it already, but, but just limiting the energy density of your foods is, is probably the, the biggest tool in your tool belt. Um, so energy density just means the amount of calories contained in 100 grams of food weight. So things that are very high in energy density would be things like dietary fats, um, things high in simple sugars and things like that, which have quite a lot of calories, for not a lot of weight. And they tend to be not very satiating. Um, whereas we compare that to our foods, which are low in energy density, they, they tend to have quite a large food volume and food weight, but for not a lot of calories. Uh, so things like your fruits and veggies, um, your whole grains, things like that, um, you can uh, consume a larger overall um, intake of food going through the GI, uh, which, which can have a, a substantial effect on the satiety response. And often those foods that are low in energy density are also quite high in fiber. And what we know about fiber is fiber slows the trafficking of nutrients through the, the gastro, gastrointestinal tract. Um, basically, it, it forms like a gel substances through the GI, which slows those nutrients through. And even that, just that slowing process can, can have um, beneficial effects um, on satiety and specifically um, maintaining longer satiety between meals, basically, because there's, a, there's um, a slower release of, of an uptake of nutrients. Um, so yeah, that, that's probably the, the top tips that, that I'd use. And we've got a few more questions, but to uh, make sure that we don't uh, have this Q and a extend uh, too long in duration, we're going to do a bit of a rapid fire now. Uh, so Jackson, if you can in 30 seconds or less, uh, answer the following questions. Uh, which Shit, are obviously, what's that? I said, shit, all right. <laughs> you can do it, bro. 30 seconds is a long time. It's, it's one second times 30. Like, that's, that's a lot Just of Just ask my girlfriend. You can do a lot of 30 seconds. You could create an entire another human in 30 seconds, Jackson. That's impressive. I don't understand why people don't think that's an impressive feat. Like, it is. Procreating in less than 30 seconds, like, damn, we're, we're a fucking specimen. Ev evolutionary conducive. Con conducive, right? It is, it is. The quicker you can well, get it over well, and done well, with. The, yeah. yeah, that's it. The quicker that's you get on to the next problem. horse. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How many calories should you cut when uh, weight loss plateaus? I've got my clock here. Uh, if you're 
fatter and early on in the diet stage, around 10%. If you're leaner and later on in the diet stage, 5%. Awesome. Should everyone be using either refeeds or diet breaks during cutting? Uh, no. If you are uh, heavily time restricted um, before like an end date or a contest or something like that, you probably don't have the luxury of using diet breaks or refeeds um, unless you're prepared to diet much harder during the week to fit in a refeed. Uh, secondly, if the refeeds or diet breaks are causing them to, to spiral into a binge, um, then it's probably not a good idea for you either. Awesome. Uh, for gem pop dieters, is slow weight loss better than fast? Uh, no, uh, I don't think so at all. I think it's. I think actually fast weight loss is better. Um, and for anyone interested, I, I'd Google the Tempo Diet Trial, which basically is, has shown substantially better results um, in not only weight and fat loss, but also weight and fat loss maintenance 12 months later when using a faster, more aggressive and shorter weight loss period compared to slower, less aggressive, longer weight loss period. Awesome. And some questions from my followers. Again, we'll go with the rapid fire. Uh, here we go. Levi underscore Linos uh, asks, top tier supplements for muscle gain. Go. Uh, creatine monohydrate. Um, if you're not reaching a substantial, um, if, you're not, if you're not reaching two to two and a half grams of protein per kilo body weight, then protein supplements uh, out, outside of that, not much is going to help muscle gain. Cool. Uh, I, Henry Ortega asks, I lean forward when squatting. I brace and cue before, but bar path goes over the foot. Help. Uh, Jackson advice. doesn't squat, so I, I better answer <laughs> this one. I guess it's left to me. Uh, my advice would be to, number one, focus on your center of mass as you squat. So think about keeping, yes, the bar path over the midfoot, but think about being balanced on your feet, on your big toe, little toe, and heel. Uh, and I would introduce some tempos to your squats, slowing down the eccentric so that you can improve your proprioception, which is basically your spatial awareness, and slow down uh, the squat uh, on the descent. And that'll force you to reduce the load. And hopefully you can start to uh, tease out what's causing you to shift forward. Uh, it could just be a loss in upper back strength. It could be uh, forward, moment, forward movement sorry, uh, of the bar and that putting you onto your toes. Uh, but with a lighter weight and tempos, you should be able to uh, rectify that issue. Hope that helped. Uh, Daniel Moore, how can one better their metabolism? Is it possible to better without large weight gain? Say that again. So he wants to know, how can somebody better their metabolism? Is it possible increase. to increase without large weight gain? Yep. Um, no. No, it's not. Cool. That was less than 30 seconds. That was very fast procreating right there, Jackson. I'm impressed. All right. Many, many fingers. I love that Instagram. Uh, well, hold on, let, me, let me just go back because might, that might be confusing. Um, resting metabolic rate is going to be very closely tied to... Um, your oh, yeah. overall body mass and, and, and to some degree your, your fat free mass. Um, but you can, that, uh, your resting metabolic rate only can only comprises a portion. There's a reasonable portion of your total daily energy expenditure. So I'm assuming that he's asking this question because he basically wants to, has the end goal of being able to, um, have a higher maintenance calorie level or, or something like that. Basically yeah. eat more food, um, but maintaining weight. So, you're, going to, you're very restricted in, in increasing your resting metabolic rate without weight gain, um, but you can absolutely increase your total daily energy expenditure by being more active. Nice. Awesome. Uh, next question is uh, from Many Many Fingers. Uh, how long does local fatigue last after a set, such as high threshold motor unit recruitment, are still recruited into the next set? So local fatigue, uh, depending on what kind of uh, local fatigue you're talking about, uh, could be muscle damage, uh, which lasts days, obviously. Uh, could be metabolite buildup, which usually uh, can be dissipated uh, two within three minutes. Yeah, two to three minutes. Uh, and high threshold bony recruitment. So basically, we have we know there's a phenomenon called post-activation potentiation. Uh, so once you activate high threshold modiness, those uh, modiness is still activated in the subsequent sets. I'd recommend looking that up. Uh, but in short, uh, local fatigue, depending on what it is, will last a different time frame. Uh, and so high threshold motor units will, yes, according to post-activation potentiation theory, still be activated into your next set. 
Uh, next question from EWSO. Uh, Uso, when you calculate the volume of triceps, do you consider the exercise of chest? Uh, so what he's asking is, do you attribute volume from pushing exercises, uh, where the chest is a prime mover, as a set for the triceps? And no, I, I don't. don't. I don't. I think it's just uh, overkill. Uh, if you want to, you can attribute it as half a set, but I would only attribute that set if it's like a chest movement, if the exercise is altered in a way that it now biases the triceps more than a chest. For example, if you're doing a bench press and you now do a close group bench press, it's targeting the triceps a lot more, and I would count that as one set for the triceps. Final question. Ben Stanza Fitness says that he can't believe that I'm cheating on him with somebody else. I've had it with bromances. Sorry, Ben. I love Jackson. He lives in Australia. It's just easy, man. I Get the, the fuck whole, out of here, Ben, mate. I couldn't you do the whole long chat. distance uh, UK relationship, bro. I'm sorry. The accent, the scones and jam and cream. Putting jam on first and then cream is how you do it. You don't put cream, then jam. I don't understand uh, you guys. That's but messy. Yeah, that is messy. Anyway, guys, that is all for this Q&A. Thank you very much for joining us and submitting your questions uh, to our portal subscribers and also everyone else on Jackson and my profile who submitted questions. We appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed this and we'll chat to you next time. All right. Oh, shit. Cancel that. <laughs>